UFC 291 was just announced for Salt Lake City, Utah, and it's like the best card of the year when it comes to name value. It's crazy. They just threw it out there out of nowhere. So we're going to start from bottom to the top. Now, this is not the full card, but we got Stephen Wonderboy Thompson versus Michelle Pereira. So we finally got a fight for Wonderboy, and Pereira was a guy that we thought that made sense for Wonderboy. He doesn't want to fight wrestlers anymore. He wants to go up against exciting strikers, and Michelle is exactly that. He's a wild card, man. He's a crazy fighter out there to contest the clean technical striking of Wonderboy. Then we got Michael Chiesa finally coming back after a year and a half since he lost to Sean Brady. Right now, he's coming off a two-loss streak. He's going to be going up against Kevin Holland. Now, Kevin Holland also asked for these kind of matchups that Wonderboy did, but he's not going to be granted it. Instead of a striker that he wants, he's going to go up against a grappler. That's a fair fight. Tony Ferguson is coming back as well. Since his short notice loss to Nate Diaz, he's in the lightweight division and going up against Bobby Green. This is interesting because these two guys have been competing in the lightweight division. Man, I hate this for Tony Ferguson, but as a Bobby Green fan, you couldn't be happier. This is the kind of fight that can really get his name out there. At the same time, for a while, it's actually kind of crazy they never fought each other so we're finally good to see it but this one's gonna be with an old weathered damaged tony ferguson whereas bobby green's like in the best of his career right now he's in his prime so i'm definitely gonna be looking away from that fight every time bobby green throws a punch don't want to see tony get hurt out there man now here's when we get really interesting Paulo Costa. Paulo Costa finally is fighting somebody after allegedly turning down Whitaker and Hamzat, even though his manager is saying like he's making a million dollars of fighting stuff, more money than Poetan and Oliveira. He's not going up against a ranked contender, but he is going up against someone who definitely has talent to be ranked, and that is Ikram Aliskarov. Yeah, the guy that just fought for his UFC debut is going up against the number five Paulo Costa. I don't know how Costa went from his previous opponents, Whitaker and Hamza to Aliskarov. Looks like they're punishing Costa. Then the Coleman event is gonna be Jan Blahovic. He's not getting that rematch with Magomed Ankalaev, at least if he wins this fight. And he's going up against the much anticipated Alex Pereira for Pereira's light heavyweight debut in the UFC. This is going to test where Pereira is at when it comes to his overall skill set in MMA. Blahovic is a well-rounded fighter. He can strike very well, and he has some decent wrestling and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, at least enough that we saw before to be able to take advantage of Israel Adesanya. But he's probably going to be the smaller guy in there, which is a bit of a different dynamic than when he fought Adesanya, where Blahovic was the bigger one. And then the main event for the vacant... BMF title, I guess it makes sense for this, Dustin Pori versus Justin Gaethje 2. This fight makes total sense with how they're performing right now, Poirier beating Michael Chandler, being one of the bigger names of the lightweight division. It makes perfect sense as to why he's headlining the pay-per-view. And as for Gaethje, he got past Rafael Fazeev. That's all we asked for. If he could do that, he's going to have to fight someone like Poirier or something. And he gets the opportunity to get revenge from that TKO loss that he had against Poirier the last time. He's a completely different fighter these days. The Gaethje that fought Poirier back then was the one before he made the adjustments to become more of a technical fighter. Back then, he was a brawler so it's a completely different fight this time and let's go through these fights one by one so let's start with wonder boy versus michelle Pereira. like there's honestly not too much to say here if Pereira fights clean he's going to be fighting in wonder boy's game other than just catching him some wild exchange I don't see him beating Wonderboy in a clean fight like that. If he makes things wild, a wild outcome can happen, but he could also get countered a lot easier. Wonderboy is one of the best counter strikers in all of the UFC, and Pereira leaves his chin very much open whenever he explodes forward, and he's been dropped a few times in his career. I just think this is going to show that there's levels when it comes to striking. Now, he might attempt to take down or two. Pereira is a very big, strong guy. Even though he doesn't have the technique, he probably has the strength to get Wonderboy down, but I ultimately do favor Wonderboy in that fight for sure. Michelle's lacking a lot of the fundamentals in order to deal with someone like Wonderboy, but it is a fight, anything can happen, and he has those wild exchanges he can get into. Michael Chiesa versus Kevin Holland. This is a grappler versus striker matchup. If Chiesa gets his fight to the ground, Holland's going to be in some trouble, but he did deal pretty well with Jacare on top of him in heavier weight class too. So we can't just go and say that Chiesa's just going to submit him or something once it gets to the ground. It can happen. I wouldn't be too surprised, but on the ground, Chiesa is very good at holding positions, limiting as much space as possible to between you and him, which makes it very hard for the opponent to escape sometimes. He has some lethal arm triangles he can go in there for against Kevin Holland. I see Holland only trying to survive when it's on the ground with Chiesa. Chiesa's not going to give him the kind of space that Jacare did where Holland was able to knock him out. Now, if it stays on the feet, Kevin Holland knocks him into the bleachers. Like, this will not be close when it comes to the stand-up. And the fact that Holland's coming back so 
soon after his knockout win against Santiago Ponzinibbio, it shows that he is eager at getting a streak here and trying to knock out Chiesa. Now, the thing that gives Holland a little bit of hope when it comes to the takedown defense is he did stuff some of Hamza's takedowns. So that is interesting going to this fight with Chiesa. But if I do have to pick one or the other, it's a tough one. Holland has a good ability to survive. He's a very tough guy. I believe he is also a black belt on the ground. He has shown improved takedown defense, and he definitely has much better cardio than Chiesa. Chiesa's gas tank is a big weakness of his. So if it goes into like the third round, he's constantly attempting takedowns and stuff. I can see Holland knocking out a tired Kiesa. And the thing that makes this a lot easier for Kevin Holland is Kiesa's takedowns are a lot more obvious. It's very much understood of when he's going to shoot takedowns. So honestly, I'm going to go with Kevin Holland in this one. I'm pretty sure he's going to be the underdog, but I do like his chances in that. Tony Ferguson versus Bobby Green. I got to go with Bobby Green. Tony's just not the same guy. That version of himself that fought Nate Diaz was very hard to watch. He looked like he's aged 10 years since that fight with Michael Chandler. That was the last time he actually looked decent in there. And Bobby Green's on point. He has the counter punches. He has much better boxing. He has good takedown defense if Tony tries to go that route. And Tony's funkiness, like creativity, and sometimes even almost completely offensive kind of striking really worked for him when he had a great chin and he was on point with his athleticism. But now him being much slower, less athletic, and also having a much weaker chin, I see Bobby Green chinning him and putting him down. This could be Tony's last fight. And the guy's getting into trouble outside the cage and stuff. Like, it's just not looking too good for Tony, man. I see Bobby Green putting the hands on him however he wants, to be honest. Now we get to Polo Costa versus Ikram Aliskarov. Is the brass like sick of Costa, you know, holding that top five spot? Because he is barely fighting. He's allegedly not taking fights. So they have this guy now, Aliskarov, who's a young active fighter to take that spot from him. Someone who has not yet fought for the title. So there's a fresh face contender and someone who has history with Hamzat actually able to insert Hamza into the discussion due to the storyline. Not to get too conspiratorial, but they could be using this not only for Ikram, but also for Hamzat. This could be a competitive competitive fight. Even though Kosa is top 5 and Liskarov is not even ranked, he just made his UFC debut, Aliskov showed that he can knock you out with one punch. He has some insane Sambo skills. He's a guy that Hamza Shemaev could not even take to the ground once. He's a pretty big guy as well, so he's not going to be outsized by Costa. With his striking technique, he could really make Costa pay in a lot of these exchanges that Costa likes to get into. Now, Costa has a big chance here if he can stop the takedowns and not get too crazy with trading with the opponent. Because Costa doesn't have the greatest chin, he was barely able to trade with Luke Rockhold. And that's pretty scary. We just saw what Mike Perry did training with Luke Rockhold. And Aliskarov has one punch knockout power, deadly precision when he's able to track your head movement after filling out the fight a little bit. And the thing about Costa is his defense is very one dimensional. He doesn't move his head left or right. He only moves his head backwards or forward. This is why Luke was catching him with the lefts. Uriah Hall was catching him with jabs. Romero caught him with the left hand. And he moved forward into Adesanya's counter hooks. And that is pretty dangerous for him against the jab from Aliskarov and against that right straight. If Aliskarov throws the one-two down the center and Costa tries to lean back from that, we can see him getting dropped from it. Aliskarov also has amazing kicks and with the takedowns to go with it, I honestly do like his chances in this, going from an unranked fighter into the top five. And one of the biggest things going into the fight is the fact that Paulo Costa is barely active. He keeps taking a year off from his fights and by the time he goes up against Aliskarov, it'll be almost an entire year since he fought Luke Rockhold. And we saw that year layoff after the Marvin Vittori fight, he did not look good against Luke Rockhold. So I'm expecting him to not look that great even against Aliskarov off compared to what he looked like before when he fought Yuval Romero and Uriah Hall etc but the guy doesn't move his head too much I can see him getting chinned he does have those crazy hooks in those exchanges big body kicks and the ability to cut off the opponent very well but if he cannot back up Aliskarov because of the takedown threat and he starts moving away from Aliskarov I think Aliskarov is going to have too many attacking options when it comes to his boxing sometimes he gets wild with the overhands and stuff that could get him caught or play Kosa's game he has the big head kicks and the superb takedown skills to really take over this fight so I'm honestly going to go with Ikram Aliskarov in this one and I would pick him to win by a third round TKO and do what's crazy about this is if Aliskarov wins he's like one or two away from a title shot yeah he's essentially on a faster track to a title than even Alex Pereira was 
Now the difference is, Aliskarov has a lot of experience in MMA. It does make kind of sense as to why he would be fast tracked, but against the number five guy right now is kind of crazy. And we're pretty sure of what they're trying to set up here with Aliskarov, that fight with Hamza. We know that Hamza wants to fight in Abu Dhabi in October, which would be three months after Aliskarov's fight. So if Aliskarov can make short work of Paulo Costa, they're probably going to set up that rematch between Hamza and Aliskarov as a number one contender fight. And I never would have thought that would have been a thing if you asked me years ago, who would be fighting for the number one contender in the middleweight division, Hamza Shemaya versus Ikram Aliskarov, when we didn't even know these two guys existed a few years ago. Now in the co-main event, Jan Blahovic versus Alex Pereira. So we know if Blahovic ate... If Blahovich is able to take Pereira to the ground, this fight's over. I don't see it ending in the first round if it goes to the ground, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be surprising if it did. I think if Blahovich is able to take Pereira to the ground, I think it could potentially finish him or just cruise to a decision, but I could see him finishing him in any of the rounds. It just depends on when he wants to risk the submission attempts. If he just keeps top control like he did against Adesanya, he could just go to an easy decision when Pereira can possibly just start gassing out because of the grappling. But when it comes to the striking, Pereira is obviously the better striker. But Blahovic does a lot of things correct where he can make Pereira pay in certain sequences. If Pereira gets wild like he did against Adesanya this last time, we know Blahovic has a crazy powerful check left hook. One shot from that Polish left hook will crumble the statue that is Pereira. But if Pereira stays technical and just goes back and forth in this kind of tit-for-tat fight that Jan likes to fight in, I see Pereira winning that. I think his leg kicks are better. I think his jab is going to be a main disruptor. Blahovic gets so wild on the front foot. When he starts being aggressive, he really opens up his chin. And Adesanya was much more hesitant on throwing strikes, whereas I don't think Pereira would be. I think Pereira will be able to actually download the data a lot better than Adesanya did and start to catch Jan with some big counter shots. Once Pereira starts to have success at long range, with the leg kicks, with the teeps to the body, with the jabs and you know fainting and all of that stuff, I think Blahovic is going to have to start exploding forward, kind of how we did against Thiago Santos back in the day. Where Santos was giving him issues with his quick footwork, Pereira will be using his range to frustrate Blahovic. Very different from the way that Izzy could. And I could see Pereira knocking him out or just hurting him winning on points. The only the only issue is if Blahovic starts faking takedowns or setting up a striking with the takedowns, it could throw off Pereira's entire mindset when it comes to what he could do on the feet. Because he's only going to be thinking about striking as a counter not stopping the takedowns that are coming behind Blahovich's punches, which is actually something that Pereira is not used to yet. He has never fought a guy who's setting up takedowns behind his own punches. Now, Blahovich is a very slow fighter, so potentially Pereira could be fast enough, he's going to have the speed advantage, obviously, to be able to see Jan's takedowns come out there. It just depends, does he have the correct technique in order to defend that kind of takedown? Because he is a big guy, he actually might be the bigger guy going into the fight. And Izzy saw the takedowns, judging from the moment he looked to defend, but Jan proved to be too strong regardless of Izzy's efforts. Pereira has the size and the strength to contest with Jan in that area, he just needs the technique. So if he could just have the fundamental defense of stopping a double leg, which is the main thing that Blahovich goals for i can see how Pereira wins this fight to be honest but with the grappling disparity i am ultimately going to go with jan blahovic he is an older guy a lot of people seem to think that you know blahovic has such a big chance of winning this he should be such a massive favorite i actually think it's very close given the age factor given the size of Pereira, the striking skill of Pereira, and the fact that he's been training takedown defense for such a long time at this point he just hasn't really shown it too much so if it's a three-round fight, I will say Blahovic wins a decision. If it's a five-round fight, I will go with Blahovic in a fourth-round knockout. I think in a five-rounder, the takedowns would zap Pereira every single round. His gas tank would be completely empty by the fourth or the fifth because grappling cardio is very different than striking cardio. And I don't think Pereira's used to it yet, especially with a guy who's like 220, 230 pounds laying on top of him and putting pressure on him for three plus rounds and then we go to the main event dustin poirier versus justin gaethje 2 both guys are in their prime never looked better and 100 percent they're both going to show their grit in this fight as well just like last time but under different circumstances dustin obviously has the better boxing overall gaethje's developed his boxing to a point where he's able to even outbox rafael vaziv his light kicks are always going to be a major factor dustin doesn't really check kicks too much he's much better these days at doing it just how we showed against conor mcgregor back in the day when they first fought he just didn't check leg kicks at all but these days i can see him checking a few whereas justin gaethje is not going to be as open to the punches as he was before his footwork is a lot more elusive these days it's going to cause the plotter dustin poirier to have to come at him in order to land his own punches which could ultimately open poirier up for gaethje's counters if poirier has to reach in there in order to catch gaethje 
who's going to be moving around and throwing light kicks at him. The fact that in opposite stances, the right straight from Geishi could be a massive weapon for him. Almost like what he did against Tony Ferguson, which again was much further than when he fought Dustin Poirier. He was a completely different version of Geishi. Look what he was able to do with his right straights, causing Tony to run into them. I can see him doing the same thing against Dustin Poirier as well. Now his jabs are not going to be as useful because of the fact they are in opposite stances and Poirier has such a good ability to pull on jabs and counter with his own jab. When it comes to that kind of fight where Geishi has to throw out jabs in order to dictate distance and find his right hand and stuff like that, I think Poirier is just much better in that area. The closer boxing range, Geisha could be in some trouble there. He has the power to always make anything happen, and he has a light kicks in that range too, which is crazy he's able to throw those there. Poirier's defense is just so on point these days. His guard is so tight. His jab is so disruptive. His right hook around the guard is so precise. When Geisha starts to get lit up in that close range, he still does what he did before. He shells up, and that's how Poirier was able to really hurt him with the hooks. He gets those hooks around the guard, digging them into your temple and into your jaw. So that kind of range, Poirier's just going to be lighting up Geishi just like he did the first time. Geishi's way of winning this is a lot of distance, a lot of footwork, a lot of movement, and drawing Poirier into the punches. If he goes back and forth with Poirier in these exchanges, anything can happen. These are two of the top guys in the lightweight division that have knockout power. Geishi has more power than Poirier, punch for punch, and he also is very durable, so he can make something happen behind his attributes. But when it actually comes to his skills, the best way for him is to draw Poirier who doesn't move too much, get him to reach with his punches, drawing him into that right hand. That's the best way Geishi is going to be able to beat Dustin Poirier, kind of how he beat Tony Ferguson. Things get really rough though if Geishi gets backed up to the fence and Poirier starts cutting him off. That's where it's going to be very bad for Geishi. So he's absolutely going to have to be mindful of where he is in the cage, very accurate in the distance between his back and the fence. If he can stay on the inside of the black lines, he has a lot going for him here because Poirier is really good at cutting off the cage but he just doesn't move too much, right? He's a plotter. A lot of times when he puts his hands on you, you just forget where you are in the octagon and you naturally just start backing up into the fence and that's where he barrages you with crazy combos. So if I were to pick a winner here, I could honestly see how both these guys win. I think it's very close, almost a pick em, but I cannot doubt Dustin Poirier in this one. He's too tough, he's too technical, he has the confidence going into it knowing that he beat Geishi already and finished him. He knows how to deal with light kicks much better than ever before, but if Geishi plays this smart, he could really hurt Dustin Poirier. And it would be pretty cool for Dustin to get that BMF title, you know, his friend used to have it, Hori Mazadel, and if Poirier can bring that back to the same gym, that would be pretty cool for him. I kind of agree, whoever wins this is kind of like the BMF, I think like RDA deserves it, or... Charles Oliveira, you know, a lot of these guys also are part of that whole group. But this fight seems fitting, and I understand why it's headlining a pay-per-view. It's a big fight. Crazy card. This is the biggest card of the year when it comes to name value. So many good fights already announced. And leave in the comments below, what do you guys think? Do you guys like the card? Which is your favorite fight? And what are your predictions, your picks out of all of these? Make sure to like, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.